A few weeks ago, I made a video about Catalonia and the Catalan independence movement. But Spain isn't the only country where secessionist movements are growing. In the United Kingdom, of course, Scotland is the famous example, as its SNP, or Scottish National Party, in 2014 was able to secure an independence referendum that was only narrowly defeated with Scotland remaining in the United Kingdom. Nevertheless, in 2021, they are still the third largest party in the entire United Kingdom. And within Scotland itself, they form a large majority in the Scottish Parliament. Further south, in Wales, there are growing voices for further devolution, with the new Plaid Cymru Party, or the Party of Wales, gaining more votes. And there is even a campaign ahead called Yes Cymru for Welsh independence. Further south and to the west of Wales, the region of Cornwall, although officially part of England, has also got a strong national identity and its own Mebion Kernow party, or the Sons of Cornwall, is also calling for further devolution away from England. And they are no longer alone. Now there is another party that is seeking to gain more devolution and in actual fact complete independence for the northern part of the country. And this is called the NIP, or the Northern Independence Party, and that's what I want to talk about in this video. Why they want to create a separate state of Northumbria, as well as looking at some of the historical claims they make about Northumbria, and some of the reasons why they want to leave the United Kingdom to start their own northern country. Before getting into that, a quick word from today's video sponsor, which is Magellan TV. Magellan TV is a paid-for video streaming service with thousands of different documentaries that you can gain access to with a small monthly fee. They cover many different topics like science, nature and history. I'd like to recommend one in particular today which is the Shoreline Detective series, in particular the episode on Northumberland as I will be talking about Northumbrian history today as well as sort of the general north. But it's a very interesting program where they look at archaeology and specifically relating to archaeology on the coast and the new findings that are being made there. So it's a really great watch and you can have access to this and many other documentaries on similar topics by going to Magellan TV. There's even a special offer for viewers of this channel. You can either go to the description or simply type try.magellantv.com slash history with Hilbert for a free month of premium membership. It's really worth checking out, so do check it out because that does help out the channel as well and you can get access to all these great documentaries. But anyway, let's dive into it. The party was founded in 2020 by Philip. Philip Proudfoot and said that much of his inspiration came from the way that the COVID-19 pandemic was handled in England. England at the time was in a tiered system in which tiers were assigned depending on the number of coronavirus cases in particular areas of the country. And as you can see, both tier three areas were in the north of England and the majority of tier two areas were also in the north, meaning that businesses had to shut and people's livelihoods were put on hold. One of these areas was Greater Manchester, and this was a real problem as the entire business in Greater Manchester had to stop while other areas of the country could continue. This was raised by the mayor of Manchester, Andy Burnham, who said that without more financial support from the government, people would start to descend into poverty in this area because they could no longer support themselves, and so argued against putting Greater Manchester into Tier 3. While this standoff between a northern mayor and the Westminster establishment provided this this great meme at the same time, it did highlight several issues with the north-south divide, as northern areas appeared to be put into more restricted tier lockdowns faster than southern ones, as well as highlighting problems from far before the coronavirus pandemic of inequalities between the north and the south. And these inequalities, the Northern Independence Party say, will only go away if there comes a physical international border between the two. The party's stated main aim, therefore, is to create a separate state called Northumbria that would break away from England in the south. This Northumbria is a name that goes back to the Anglo-Saxon period and is the name of a kingdom that was established in the 7th century that in Old English was known as Northern Himbrerice and is the kingdom that is north of the Humber, the Humber being an important river that bisects England. Part of the NIP's mission, therefore, is to raise an awareness of this old Northumbrian past and to claim that this is the basis upon which to found independence. 
There's certainly true that Northumbria was a separate Anglo-Saxon kingdom, but at this time there was not yet a kingdom of England, and in fact England was split into several of these Anglo-Saxon as well as several Brythonic kingdoms that rose and fell with the decades and centuries. Northumbria itself was the product of unification between a northern kingdom of Benicia centering around Northumbria or Northumberland and Bambra, and Deira which centered around modern Yorkshire. It also expanded further north during the reign of Oswald and his brother Oswy to include Edinburgh, although they have said in several interviews that they would not be asking for Edinburgh to be united with Northumbria as they were on good terms with the SNP who would lose a capital. Though it is true that the burr part of Edinburgh is from the Old English word for burg, which means something like a fortified centre. The claim of adding the northwest of England to this Northumbria, however, is a bit more sketchy as for a very long time this was an independent entity of Brythonic kingdoms that resisted Northumbrian expansion, despite what Proudfoot has said in several of the interviews. It's true that eventually areas of the northwest were incorporated into Northumbria, but even for a long time afterwards, they actually had more in common, and this can be seen in the name Cumbria, which today is part of the North west of England is related to Cymru, which of course is the Welsh name for Wales, given that for a long time there were Cumbric speakers there, a language related to modern Welsh, and this means kin. Culturally this region was quite different, and politically too, it was for a long time controlled by various Brythonic entities. Beforehand you had the Kingdom of Hreged, and then afterwards you also had the Kingdom of Strathclyde, that throughout the 10th century pushed southwards too. You also had an influx of settlers from Norse Ireland, and that's why you have a lot of place names in the Lake District that come from Old Norse names. So there is a bit of a different history in the Northwest, and culturally you can actually still see that if you look at toponyms and elements of dialect and such. But those are a few remarks about the uh, name of Northumbria. He also says that the Welsh name for the North was Hen Ogledd, which means the Old North, and I actually have a video about that if you're interested in seeing that specifically. That is true to some degree, but actually that just refers to the northwestern part, this Brythonic area, and certainly does not refer to Northumbria, as these were seen as the enemy of those in Wales, who often use the term Hen Ogledd to describe the old Cymru, the old kin that they had in this region. The Dane law might also be something that was shared between many of these northern regions, and this is the name that's commonly given to that area of land that was taken by elements of the great heathen army from the 860s onwards and that then had some degree of Scandinavian settlement depending largely on where you were although of course as you can see on this map that also included areas of the southeast as well as those areas in the north and actually the name Northumbria if we're using that was split in the Dane law so only the southern part of Northumbria the area of old Deira up to about the Tees became the kingdom of Jurvik which is the name that would eventually give us York well to the north you had a more independent uh, movement continuing from around Bambra, the, that old capital of Benicia, with the earls of Bambra being somewhat independent and often fighting against those Danes surrounding Jorvik as well. So that's a bit of a division once again between that entity of Northumbria, which is interesting. And eventually, of course, this Dane law would be included into England. And the reason I'm bringing this up is because on their website, they say that Northumbria existed from the 7th century to the 10th century, which isn't actually true. There were many political entities that came and went in this region, as I've explained here with the Dane law and as well with the complications in Northwest England. But it might be possible to speak of a Northumbrian identity, as actually later on in charters you get from Anglo-Saxon kings who were ruling England, they mentioned that they ruled over the English, the Danes, and the Northumbrians. So there is something to be said about a somewhat separate identity for the Northumbrians. And this is something as well that I've brought up in my video series on the making of England, which I must continue. In 1066, the Normans invaded, and in the subsequent years, there were many risings in the north, which led up to the harrying of the north, which is basically the Normans coming and completely destroying the north, north of the Humber. And this actually is still pointed to by some people as the start of the north-south divide, that so much wealth was taken and so many people were killed in the north that it's actually never caught up again with the south. Because if you looked at the Anglo-Saxon period, a lot of the time the Northumbrians were the top dog on the island of Britain. And it even had its own golden age, the Northumbrian golden age, with bead and illuminated manuscripts and carving and gold work and its military being... 
the best in the island of Britain, but after this period, it never reaches that prominence once again. Of course, later it's fought over by the Scots and the English, and that's why there are so many castles, especially in my county of Northumberland. And actually in 1403, there's a very interesting development with Henry Percy, who is also more commonly known by his nickname as Harry Hotspur, and he's the reason that Tottenham Hotspur is named after him, but that's something for another video. And he's still remembered in the North as a very strong and powerful figure that did unite large areas, as in 2010 in Anik, they erected a statue of him. What's interesting is that his predecessor, following his rebellion against the English king Henry IV that ended disastrously at the Battle of Shrewsbury, is that during the tripartite indenture, he and the Welsh rebel Owen Glyndwr actually sought to divide England along with Edmund Mortimer along these lines. And this is a map that is often shared by the account of the Northern Independence Party to say, look, there is this identity of Northumbria, but what I might say about this is that this map never came into action as the plots failed and this Northumbria as you can see is quite different to the entity that was Northumbria back in the Anglo-Saxon period as several centuries had gone by although possibly you could say this is that identity coming back to the top again. During the Wars of the Roses and their aftermath, something that I've talked about a lot in other videos, there were a lot of uprisings spanning from the north and attacking the capital London. In 1536, following the dissolution of the monasteries, you got the Pilgrimage of Grace starting once again in the north and having popular support there against Henry VIII and confiscating the land of the large monasteries. And continuing into the reign of his successors, this is one uh, still from a video that I made about Queen Elizabeth. A lot of the plots came from the north of the country as well as many of the major risings. Now one of the reasons for this, if you look at the number of plots, you can see in 1487, 1489, 1536, 1537 and 1569 from the Tudor period, you have these risings that are occurring from the north that often targeted London and actually just to show that Cornwall as well which is another separatist region also had quite a large share of the plots. I should also mention that there were risings in the southeast at this time some from Kent and some from East Anglia but there is a disproportionately large amount of risings from the north that perhaps shows that this area was always more prone and more independent minded even going into the renaissance period. Part of the reason for this is definitely distance from the capital, which is something that Northumberland and Cornwall both shared. But another part is that in the north, there were more likely to be more Catholics as those who converted to Protestantism in the south. It was especially in the southeast as these had the most contacts with those in the Low Countries and Germany who were the first to start converting to Protestantism. While in the north, more of the older landowning aristocratic families remained Catholics. And to this day, there are more Catholics in the north per capita than there are to the south, which shows those holding on to older belief sets. In 1715 and 1745, years of Jacobite risings, they rose largely in Scotland. But once again, in both risings, there were risings that occurred in Northumberland with Northumbrian Jacobites supporting the old and the new pretender as well as in Cornwall, which again is an interesting comparison. Throughout the 19th century, the North became increasingly industrialized, using things like manufacturing as well as, very importantly for large areas of the North, coal mining, which made it a major region of industrial success. Along with the industrialization also came new political ideas, with trade unions and socialism becoming very popular in the north, as opposed to other areas in the south that were more likely to support liberal or conservative politicians. Mining communities, the vast majority of which were in the north, with some in Wales as well, were particularly badly affected following the failure of the 1984 miners' strike when the government announced that they would be closing a number of collieries. Nevertheless, the north retained the label of being the Red Wall, this being a political term indicating that the vast majority of these areas in the North always voted for Labour and so were safe seats for the party. In 2016, therefore, it came as a bit of a shock that so many areas in the North voted very strongly to leave the European Union in the Brexit vote. 
but in 2017 it's still clear that the red wall was holding with that huge swath of Labour voting seats in the north of England. However, in 2019, in that general election, there were major cracks in the red wall. And as you can see, the Conservatives in blue started to receive far more votes in the north. This was a huge shock to the political system, given that many of these seats had not voted for the Conservative Party for many decades, some for as long as since 1918. And into this mess in 2020, with the North having unexpectedly voted for Brexit and becoming disillusioned with what had for decades been the only political choice on the ballot, the Labour Party, the Northern Independence Party, was created in opposition to both Labour, which they claim is stale and no longer appealing to working people, especially those in the North, and the Conservative Party, which has always been a bit of an uncomfortable choice for many working class people in the North to vote for. Their appeal to Northern voters is that the North-South divide has become untenable and that the two major parties that are dominating the entire country, Labour and the Conservatives, are both not going to do anything about it. In Northern Europe, nine out of the 10 most deprived areas are in the United Kingdom and five of ten of those are north of the Humber. Durham and the Tees, East Yorkshire, South Yorkshire, Lancashire and Lincolnshire are five of the most deprived areas in all of Northern Europe, while the least deprived area in all of Northern Europe is the capital of the very same country, London. From 1965 to 2015, a study was done and it was found that in terms of life expectancy throughout the whole period, mortality rates in the north were always 15% higher than in the south, which resulted in about 38,000 excess deaths each year in the north with compared to the south. This also translates to a divide in education as well. In the South, children who received free school meals, so those from poorer income households, were at least two times as likely to end up going to university as those receiving free school meals in the North. This disparity can also be seen in higher education. Let's take a look at, for example, the universities, both of them. Oxbridge is the name that is given to the two oldest universities in England, standing for Oxford and Cambridge respectively. The reason why this is so important is that these are seen as the best universities in the country, and although fewer of 1% of the population of the United Kingdom goes to these universities, the vast majority of prime ministers and people holding important positions in the country have indeed gone to either Oxford or to Cambridge. And so admissions there is seen as a big deal. For me personally, this is also an important issue because I am someone who was raised in the North and who now studies at the University of Cambridge and has experienced with, you know, personally, that there are not many people from the North in Cambridge and that there are far more people from London that are here and that there is a certain expectation, however subtle, that people who do go to this university have come from London or somewhere else in the home counties. And it's seen as being rather exotic if you come from somewhere else, which, you know, has its own reasons why. And I'm not saying this is because of overt discrimination in all cases against northerners or people from the north. But I do understand that this is an issue and have personally witnessed this having grown up in the north my whole life and then moved to Cambridge for University. These things become very clear in a way that I hadn't realized before I had actually moved to university. And this isn't just based on my feeling of there not being many northerners around. If you compare the number of offers that are made to people in Northern England, which constitutes of the regions of Yorkshire and the Humber, Northwest and Northeast England, and compare that to Southeastern England and London within that, then you can see that the populations are not that different in size, around 15 and a half million in those Northern regions or the North, which is basically the new proposed entity of Northumbria, and around 18 million in the Southeast and London collectively. Yet if you look at offers that are made by Oxford and by Cambridge, you can see that those in the north are only receiving around 15% from Oxford and 17% from Cambridge for those three regions, whereas the southeastern London receive 48% 
from both. So that's clearly far more for this region, despite the fact that in terms of population, that clearly does not correlate with the amount that they are getting that is higher. Of course, this is largely down to the A-levels or final exams that students sit in high school, as both Oxford and Cambridge say that they are only accepting the very best of students and that therefore if those in the north are performing more poorly, it makes sense that they are receiving fewer applications. But that also points to a difference in the education education in the north and the south and actually if you look at students that receive three A's at A level so that would be like I think eights or nines in in Europe but basically that have done fairly well in their exams there are only around 6,000 in the north of England whereas in the southeast and among a similar number of students you get 15,700. The divide can also be seen in transport with the per capita spending on transport in London so that's per person the amount that is spent on transport being around 2,500 whereas compared with the region that I grew up in the northeast it was just five pounds. And again, from personal experience, I remember in my first year at university getting a train from Cambridge to London and marveling at how well the system ran, how clean the train was and how modern, because back home in the Northeast, we were still using trains. And I think it's only just been updated that ran for the first time in the 1970s. So this is something that I've sort of experienced firsthand in a way, and I thought that was interesting to include in this video. And this is why I think politicians are constantly talking about leveling up the North. And there was this great scheme that was called the Northern Powerhouse that wanted to connect parts of the North, like in the south of Yorkshire and Manchester, which arguably isn't that far North when you're used to Newcastle that they wanted to create a northern powerhouse here, but this really hasn't happened. And if you look at jobs growth in comparison with the northern powerhouse region, it's less than half of the jobs growth that has been occurring in London and the southeast, thanks to government spending and investment. Politically, too, the plan to redraw the borders of the constituencies of voting in the United Kingdom really would take more power from the north and centralise it further to the south. As it stands in 2021, this is the distribution of seats that you can see per region. But the plan is that in 2023, they're going to change this. And as you can see, the Northeast would lose two seats. The Northwest would also lose two seats, while Yorkshire and the Humber would stay the same. Meanwhile, the Southeast would gain seven, the Southwest would gain three, and London would gain two. In 2015, the Secretary of the Treasury said that the UK was the almost the most centralised developed country. And I'm not sure if this is verified, but the leader of the Northern Independence Party, uh, Philip Proudfoot, often claims that the UK is 300 times more centralised than any other European country. I'm not sure if that's exactly the statistic that he cites, but it's something along those lines. And basically, the plot of the argument is that so much power is in London and Westminster, and that hardly any of that is benefiting people in the North. And this may have been part of the reason why people voted for Brexit. Another major part of the Northern Independence Party's gripe is also socially, with attitudes of Northerners like the North FC memes of being lazy and always looking for jobs and being very grim up North as well as being slightly racist and backwards and socially conservative, which he wants to change with his party, as well as the fact that regional accents are not heard that often on television, although that has been improving, and that these are often laughed at or made fun of or seen as humorous rather than being just the way that people speak as southern accents often are. The solution being proposed by the Northern Independence Party is that the only way these inequalities can be righted is if the North secedes and becomes its own country apart from the rest of the United Kingdom or whatever remains at that point. But what would this actually look like, a separate Northumbria as its own country? Well, it would have a population, as stated, of around 15 and a half million. The proposed plan is that it would make up several of the northern counties of the current country of England. These counties are Northumberland, Tyne and Weir, County Durham, North Yorkshire, the East Riding of Yorkshire, West Yorkshire, Greater Manchester, Cheshire and South Yorkshire, as well as Merseyside, Lancashire and Cumbria, in the northwest. 
They would also give the opportunity for those counties to the south, the kind of border strip, to also vote to join this independent north. This new independent Northumberland would take quite a few of the current cities of England with it, including Newcastle, Sunderland and Durham in the northeast, places like York, Leeds and Sheffield in Yorkshire, as well as in the northwest, Lancaster, Liverpool and Manchester. The capital that has been proposed in some of the interviews was York, although they've also floated the idea of having several sort of revolving capitals or centres of importance, including Newcastle, Durham, York, Manchester and Liverpool, although they have ruled out uh, that Manchester would become the capital because they say that they don't want to repeat the same problems as with London, but in the north. The Northern Independence Party on a political field is quite far left. They say they are democratic socialists who want democratic socialism and that they want to create a green industrial rebirth in the North to kickstart the Northern economy whilst being environmentally conscious and environmentally friendly. Their mini manifesto was leaked in March of this year to the Huff Post and included such things as government control over water and energy, as well as legalization of marijuana and a 15% pay rise for nurses, whilst sentences for sheep rustling would be increased owing to the fact that there are many farmers in the North and this is a real issue for many of those farmers. One question they would have to answer is whether or not they would reapply for the European Union. What they've said is that they respect the Brexit vote, which of course many in the North voted for, but that if the people wanted another vote, then they would allow this. This is one thing that is very different from Scottish independence to the proposed Northumbrian independence, as Scotland voted overwhelmingly to remain in the European Union. And this is one of the main drivers between the post-2016 SNP, the cause for a new independence referendum, is that while the United Kingdom has left the European Union, those in Scotland voted to remain in. And so if Scotland were to become independent, they would reapply for membership as the people of Scotland voted to do so in the 2016 election. And this, of course, the Northern Independence Party would have to wrestle with as their people did not vote to remain in the European Union and that is indeed what the United Kingdom has done. With policies like these, it seems that they might be trying to target voters who would normally have voted Labour but are dissatisfied with the direction the party is going in under the leadership of Keir Starmer, who is seen by many after a year of being at the head of the Labour Party as not really having done anything. They may also be trying to appeal to those who were more in favour of Jeremy Corbyn, who was further to the left, with several of their policies, particularly their direction of socialism. They have quite a large following on social media, with around 52,000 followers on Twitter, as well as around 11,000 likes on Facebook. But it remains to be seen whether this social media presence will actually translate into getting votes and ballots in. They are actually standing for by-election in Hartlepool, which is at the time of recording will be in exactly a month. So we will see if the Northern Independence Party will take off or whether it's just a social media flurry that has got several people excited. At the current time, looking at polls, they seem to be behind the Conservatives and Labour with just around 2%, while the Conservatives are at around 49% and Labour at around 42% likely to win. What is very impressive, however, though, is that they are third and at only around 1%, the Liberal Democrats are behind this new Northern Independence Party. And considering that the Liberal Democrats were jointly in power of the country in 2010 to 2015, it is rather amazing that this new party has already edged ahead of them in this seat, although they were never popular in Hartlepool, so take from that what you will. The question of Northern Independence is very interesting. I don't think it's very likely, but I saw this party coming up on social media and knew that I had to make a video about it. And having looked at some of the points that they make, I think it's clear that there are many problems in terms of the North-South divide. And having looked at my own personal experiences, I can attest to having a, an idea that this is indeed a problem that should be addressed. While I don't think that Northern Independence is likely, and I'm not trying to convince anyone to support this party or not support this party, I leave that completely and utterly up to you. I think it would be a good thing if more politicians take an interest in the North and look to try and solve some of these problems as they are affecting many lives that 
at the moment politicians are simply not looking at at all. So much for watching this video and a big thank you to my friend Charlie for helping me out with some of the pictures in the video. Little reminder that the merch store is open. I am wearing one of the lovely pieces of clothing that I am selling over there. So you can check the link in the description below, as well as if you want to find out any of my sources for the video and to check out the party themselves. This is not an endorsement of the party. This is simply if you want to fact check what I'm saying, then you can find it in the description below. If you're new, feel free to subscribe. Give me a thumbs up. If you did enjoy that, that would really help me out. But anyway, hope you all enjoyed and have a great day. I am Hilbert and this has been The History.